really is one of the main things that will bring you joy throughout your Christian life. And I really believe that. The, the, the people I know who make it a regular habit of doing evangelism and just being involved in it in one way or another. And, and, and today we're going out on the street, and right away I just want to say that this isn't like designed to make you a street preacher or you know one of the, one of those crazy people out on the street. Evangel like so in the training, that's the method we use to, to train, but evangelism can be done and should be done in all kinds of different settings. So so one of the things that a lot of people get intimidated by is just the idea of of, of being a street preacher. And and evangelism, yeah, it definitely involves it includes that, but that's not everything about you know, that's that's not when you think about the word evangelism, you don't have to automatically go there. Yesterday, I was reminded, wow, so clearly about why this is important and, and, and how it is such a blessing. We, we were, uh, was traveling, and in between flights, I got a call, and it was from a guy named Nick. And Nick is someone who lives in Montana, who three years ago, he lived in Oceanside. And I was out on the Oceanside Pier um, this, this one night and just got to talking to this, this lady and she was a Christian, and you know we're out there sharing the gospel. And she says, "Man, I need to bring my son so he can hear you." She brings her son the next week. She actually did it. So many people say, "Yeah, I'm going to bring him." We never see him again. <laughs> they actually come. And Nick, um, he's in his early twenties, in and out of Alcoholics Anonymous, Drug Anonymous, whatever whatever they call it, and just really struggling. So, so he comes over, and he's very quiet the whole time. And I just speak to him, and his, his mom's like, listen to him, it's so awkward. But So I, I, I talk to him, and you know, just take him to the, the, the gospel, as simple as it, it is. And he listened, and, um, and then he, ta he told me a little about, it, about his uh, Alcoholics Anonymous. And, and if you're not familiar with that, you know, that it's, they do a lot of good, and that they get people to stop being drunk a lot of times, but they do a lot of harm in a biblical sense, because they teach all kinds of idolatry and all, all kinds of anti-biblical things. So I, I, you know, again, I, I just have a love-hate, more-hate relationship <laughs> to, towards, towards that kind of thing. But anyway, so I, I was listening to him about what, how they do the, the AA thing. And I said, you know, that, that's uh, great that you're doing less drugs, but you really need to focus on Christ and trust in him and, and read more about him. And, you know, so it was kind of a not too long conversation and, and he goes on his way and, and the night is over. And I had given him my contact information. So a few months later, I get a call from him and he says, yeah, you know what? I, 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 I got saved. I thought about what you said. I started reading my Bible. I found a church near me. He moved to Montana, so he's in Montana now. And then, you know, I'm really happy because that doesn't happen a lot. <laughs> it doesn't happen all the time. And then a few months later, he called me back, and, and I had sent him another book on drug abuse from a biblical perspective. And he said, I read that book, and now I, I stopped the AA, and now I go to a Christian based counseling, and I'm involved in church. And so that was great. And then yesterday, um, this is like two and a half years later, three years later. He calls me out of nowhere, and he just wanted some, you know, advice on a struggle he's going through right now. But he's in church, and he's he's pressing on, and it was just such a blessing to just, you know, if it's just that one guy that God used me and my little witnessing team, and then the little gospel tracks we have. If it's just that one guy, that's that's awesome. It's amazing. And yet, we have the opportunity to be involved in that kind of conversation every day of our lives, you know? And even, and even if, if, if you're someone who really is just a person who's constantly around your church and, and your, your whole lifestyle is revolved around your church, even at your church, I guarantee you there's some unsaved people there, you know? And, and, and wherever it is you're, you're at, it's, it's just a beautiful opportunity that we have to be involved in the lives 
of the people around us, you know, lost, lost and saved, or, or the, the ones we think that are saved, <laughs> that might not be, you know, you, you just never know. So today what we're going to do is we're going to look at some, just, just a very basic look at what we're to share when we share the gospel. When you think of evangelism, there's, there's so much that can be said, and yet it's really important right from the start just to, to think of the, the, the basics, and that's kind of what we're going to be doing today. So evangelism is the proclamation of the good news, you know, it's, it's the announcing of the good news of, of the king. And you think about the Great Commission, Matthew 28, 18. Jesus came up, came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So this is a great commission, and evangelism is, is about going out into the world going into your neighborhood or going into your dining room and just proclaiming the, the, the news of the great king. Now a lot has, you know, if you, if you go to seminary maybe or you're in a very deep Bible study, a lot of times this verse, the, the, the focus of this verse is making disciples. And a lot of, a lot of pastors will they'll point that out. And, and sure, that's true. And so a lot of people will say, well, I don't really evangelize, I don't really talk to lost people, I just make disciples. Meaning, the people at my church and my small groups, I disciple them, I, I train them, I do stuff with them. And that's great, we should be involved in that. This here today is, is part of that. Um, but making a disciple begins with preaching the gospel. The people in your church, they, they didn't just become Christians by magic, suddenly someone talked to them, someone spoke to them. That is part of, of making disciples, is, is the evangelism. It's the, the, the precursor to the discipleship part. So we should be involved in that in many different ways. So in the picture here, you see up at the top, we got the million dollar bill. Um, and then down at the bottom. Okay, there you go. Let's go around the clock. So, up at the top, we have a lady holding a million, million dollar bill. How many of you have never given out a million dollar bill gospel track? Before? Okay. So, so we have a lot of professional track giver outers among us today. And the way you give out a, a, a track is, is, is you just, you know, you just get it in your hand and you just go like this. Here. That's it. Um, with the million dollar bill, bill track, you could say, this is a million dollars, it has a million dollar question on the back. And with every one of the tracks, there's a little, there's a little key phrase, or a little line you, you can say like that. But down at the bottom, that is an ice cream truck. That is my church's ice cream truck, and we go around and give out free ice creams, and every ice cream comes with a free invitation to church. And so that's one of the ways, one of the creative ways that, that we're doing evangelism. But so often in churches, you'll find different ministries. We have the mountain bike ministry and the men's wrestling ministry. I don't know what you guys do. The corn ministry, maybe in these parts. But all these churches have different ministries, and those are great. And a lot of times these ministries are kind of advertised as, we're going to do this fun event and get people to come to our church, um, and then we can share the gospel with them. And that's great if that's actually happening. A lot of times what happens is it, it, it then becomes we're all going to go mountain biking and all the Christians are mountain biking and it's fun and even the non-believers come there mountain biking and it's fun but no one actually ever shares the gospel. So whether you use an ice cream truck or a mountain bike or whatever, just make sure that the gospel is, is actually going out, that that's actually happening. Now evangelism has always been a normal practice of the early, it was a normal practice of the early church. And this, this is important just to understand that a lot of, a lot of times churches, it's the culture of the church, they, they can get off track in, in different places, and, and a lot of times they're good places, but if evangelism ha isn't happening um, on a regular basis, then, then it's, it's just kind of good to, to look back and, and see what that would have looked like. And, and Acts, 1A, right from the beginning, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, 
And you shall be my witnesses, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and even to the remotest parts of the earth. You shall receive power, why? To be my witnesses. That's the reason. That was, that was the reason the power was given. And then in Acts 5.42, just talking about what was going on in, in, in the early church. And every day, and in the temple, from house to house, they kept right on teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. That's, that's what, that was the, the normal thing that was going on. Acts 8, 4, therefore, those who had been, those who had been scattered were, went about preaching the word. Now this is interesting. So in, in Acts, in, 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 in what's going on there in Acts is the church is being persecuted, so they're leaving. They, they're, they're literally leaving their towns and they're finding other places to live, and they're scattered. And today, you hear a lot of talk about the, the, the beginnings or the rumblings of, of persecution and with all the, the crazy social stuff that just seems to be getting worse all the time, it it's kind of sets in, this is more a reality. Yeah, this could actually happen. Like, this is getting more possible. We don't need to look at Pakistan. We don't need to look at China to see examples of persecution. We, we get more of a sense of, yeah, this could actually happen here. And the natural instinct sometimes is just to, to stop talking about it and be like, you know, I'm just, gonna, I'm just gonna do my Christian life over here and no one's gonna b bother me. Uh, and you know, as long as I don't talk about that transgenderism is wrong or homosexuality is a sin, or if I, as long as I don't talk about this stuff, I'll be safe. But that's not what the early church did. It said they were scattered so they were, they were literally running for their, their lives, but as they went, they went right about preaching the gospel. Like they didn't leave that part behind. That went with them. That's why the church grew. And that's why it's so important for, for us to just have a mindset of doing the same. And, and just as you go through Acts, you just continue to see example after example of what, what the church was up to all the time. That was, that was just part of what they did, and, and it's so easy to get caught up, whatever your church culture might be like, in, in something other than than that, where evangelism just becomes this thing that just a few weirdos do on the street corner, and it really doesn't involve us because we don't we don't do that kind of stuff. And yet, when we look at the entire New Testament, that's what we see. That's what Christians do: is they evangelize. And it's because we're ambassadors for Christ. We, we, are, we are ambassadors, you know. If I, if I was an ambassador for America, if they would ever see all my qualities and decide to choose me for that. If, if I was an ambassador for America over in Russia, that would be a hard job right now. And in Russia, my job would be to represent the United States and everything that we stand for. And as ambassadors for Christ, our job is to represent Christ. Our job isn't to represent our opinion on the virus or on the vaccine. Those things are important, you know, uh, very important. Um, but that's not primarily our job. Our job is to represent Jesus Christ and his kingdom and, and what he says is important, what he says is, is right or wrong. That, that's our job. 2 Corinthians 5, 18. And all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has commi committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors of Christ, as though God were making an appeal to us. We beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. That's our mission. When, when you think about the beginning of that, that section, just, just the gospel, just the fact that God did this for us. And now he's given us the opportunity to go and, and, and you know, have others do that as, as well. That we're an ambassador for him. That's amazing. Absolutely amazing. You know, you know in this conference we're going to hear so much about how marvelous and, and amazing, mind-blowing the creation is. We're going to hear a lot about that kind of thing. And yet we need to realize that same God who has created all this, put everything into place, he wants to use you. He wants you 
you, as in you, to be his ambassador and do something for him. That, that's crazy. Absolutely amazing, you know? Totally amazing. But, in, but yet, that's what evangelism is. Now, kind of an ongoing, I don't know, I don't know if you call it a debate, would be the question, is evangelism a gift? Or is it something else? Is it like a responsibility? And so often you hear, well, I watched that Ray Comfort guy, he's got the gift of evangelism. Or, you know, there's this guy at my church, you know, he, he talks to people, but he's really gifted that. He's got the gift of evangelism. And it's this idea that certain people, because they're gifted, they are the ones that do the evangelism, and the rest of us just, you know, do this other stuff. And it's kind of, it'd be kind of like saying, well, there's people in my church, they are prayer warriors. They have the gift of being able to pray, and they're the ones that pray. We really don't have to pray. We'll just let the prayer, prayer warriors take care of it all. We don't really say that about prayer. And yet, with, you know, we do use the word prayer warrior, but we don't really think, well, I don't have to pray. You know, and, and yet evangelism gets put into that category. So the, the, the place where people get the idea that evangelism is, is a gift, only for the gift, is in Ephesians 4, 11, where it says, speaking about what the gifts that God gave to the church, he said, and some, and he gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints for the work of, of service. To the building of the body of Christ. And so the argument is, well, not everyone is a pastor, obviously, and so God has given the gift of the pastor of his church, God has given the gift of evangelism in his church, therefore, I'm, I'm scot free. I'm, I'm, I, don't have to, I don't have to argue with the, the guy down, down the street or whatever it is that you're uh, anxious about. And yet, in verse 12, it shows us that. That really doesn't apply to this because it gives us the reason that God gave the church the pastors and the evangelists. It says, for the equipping of the saints, that's you, that's me, the reason evangelists exist, the reason God gave gifted evangelists exist is for the equipping of the saints for the work of service. So in other words, the reason God gives evangelists who are gifted, and they exist, guys like great comfort, the reason God give, gives us is to equip us so we can do the evangelism. You would never look at a pastor and, and tell your kid, hey, uh, they're teaching about, you know, um, you shouldn't like cheat on your homework today at church. You should go learn that. And then the pastor teaches them and then they come home and you say, you know what? I, I'm not a pastor, so I'm not going to teach you that you shouldn't cheat or you shouldn't lie. Or you shouldn't steal. That's not my job. That's a pastor's job. No, that's ridiculous, you know? The pastor teaches us, the congregation, and we teach our kids, or we, or we teach, you know, whoever, and the same is true with evangelism. We don't, we don't neglect our responsibility, and it is a responsibility, that's the answer to the question, it is a responsibility. We don't neglect that just because we don't think we're gifted in that, in that role. That's why we strive, that's why we continue to, to work at these things, it's just to get more comfortable with it and to be able to um, just be okay, be more normal with uh, evangelizing. Don't, don't use the excuse that you're not gifted in, in evangelism. Um, just allow God to, to, to work in that area in your life. And it's sad because so many people kind of view it that way. You know, Bill Bright, the guy who founded Campus Crusade, Crusade for Christ back in the day, he said, only 2% of believers in America regularly share their faith in Christ with others. And boy, when I first saw that, I thought, that's really sad. And then I realized in the churches I've been, been part of, that's true, I, I mean, it might even be higher <laughs> than what's, what, what's, you know, it's, it's sad, but only 2%. And I think about the, the huge church, biblical church that I was a part of for years, and I could think of one person who I knew, that's the guy, if you want to go evangel, if you want to know something about evangelizing, you talk to him because he actually does it. And sadly, I, I would say that's, that's probably the case at most churches. It's not a priority. And, and yet, this is something that's so clear as you read the New Testament, it's, it's something that we're supposed to be doing. 
You know, and so the question comes up: Why don't Christians witness more often? Why is it? Um, and and uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to ask you guys that. that. Well, I'm going to ask you guys that right now. Why do you think people don't do this more often? Yes. It's insecurity, it's but I think it's the devil doesn't want us out there sharing the gospel. And I think um, one of the reasons why is uh, it's just so focused on ourselves and being scared and nervous that we don't we should. Yeah, absolutely. Yep, we, we you know, we're, we're, we're scared. That's kind of the overlying of all this, but, but definitely focused on ourself, you know, in, in a bunch of different ways. What, what else? Yes. Maybe a change of the gospel? Change of the gospel. Absolutely. You know, you, you think about that. So, so most of us would say, well, I'm not ashamed of it, you know, but then when you always start thinking about what does it mean to be ashamed? And you think of being like a, a, a little kid at school and it's really easy as a little kid to be ashamed of everything. So like you come to school and you're not wearing the latest Boba Fett t-shirt and everybody else is. And you feel kind of ashamed because it's like, oh, I just got this really old, you know, Harry Potter shirt. I don't know. I don't know. I can't keep up with it anymore. But, but uh, and so you can be ashamed. And it's not that this kid necessarily loves Boba Fett or, or, or whatever. But he just kind of do, he just doesn't fit in, so he feels bad about that. And as adults, we can feel the same thing. We can think, well, um, I don't want to talk about God at the dinner party because I know all these people could care less, and it's just going to get really awkward. And it's not that you're ashamed of Jesus and what He did on the cross, but you're ashamed ashamed of being associated with Him. So, 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 yeah, absolutely, being ashamed. Of, of, of the gospel, that can happen. What, what else? Busy. Busy. Absolutely. That's that's a very honest. Just that that really comes down to it. And then, man, I don't know what it's like about, out here, but in, in, in where I, where I live, I got a, a job, I got a commute, I got four sons, I have a wife, I have ministry at church, I have. My Boba Fett, no, I'm just kidding. Um, I, I have so much stuff. And then, and then, you know, yeah, it's very easy to not make it a priority. Really. And that's really what it comes down to, right? Like, it's, it's, I'm sure there's a bunch of things we could all be doing other than this today, but we made it a priority. And then, well, anyone else? One, one last thought. Yes. Um, a lot of people uh, are concerned that they may not be able to answer some of these questions. They don't have all the answers. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and that is really good, Tony, because that leads me right into my next slide here. Yeah, so we don't, we don't know. We don't know what to say. We're not sure exactly what we're going to say. I mean, we have this image that we're going to run into one person, and they're going to have this list of 100 questions from their science class and from their philosophy class, and we're just going to be stumped, and we're going to look dumb. And we're kind of af af afraid of that. Um, and in kind of you know in the same in the same vein, we're not sure exactly what it is we, we want to say. We're not exactly sure what are we going to tell this person. Um, you think you think of the word gospel. What does that mean? Well, it means a lot, and depending on the the, the depth of the teaching of the church you go to, it can mean so much, right? And there's so many nuances and little little parts of. It. The, the, the answer to this question, what is, what is the gospel? <clears throat> Let's look at a few things that non-church people might think of when they think of the gospel, right? So I'm, this, this is what I'm talking about. People you might run into out in, in a tool of time here, when they hear the word gospel, what do they think? Well, gospel music, that's something that the gospel is. And then there's the term gospel truth. Not sure if the word truth means anything anymore, but, but gospel truth still kind of is the same. And then you have all the different religions and their take on it. So Mormons, they talk about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Okay? They talk about that a lot. I was raised Catholic. Catholics, every Sunday you go to church and they'll say, we're reading from the gospel of Mark and Matthew. And so the, the word gospel is, is very prominent in Catholicism. Um, a lot of times when I ask people, what, what do you think the gospel is? And, and a lot of times this is, Church people, 
They'll say, well, it's, it's just loving your neighbor, or it's just being nice, or, or helping people, feeding people, feed, feeding the hungry. And so, you know, the question is, what should I share when I share the gospel? What, what does that even mean? And then we, we, we look at all our gospel tracks and try to figure out which one's best, and like, what, what is the main message that we need to communicate? And I think the way to answer that question is, is just to answer another question is, why did Jesus come? What was the purpose of his coming? And again, depending on what a person's background is or the church they were raised in and walked away from, possibly, they have a different idea of what Jesus even came. Did he come to make us happy? Well, if you were watching Joel Osteen every week, that might be the answer. He came to make us happy. Did he come to make us rich? Um, a lot of churches out there teach that Illness, sickness is connected with sin, and so if you are free from sin, you're not going to be sick. Did Jesus come to make you illness free? Did he come to make all your dreams come true and, and just give you a, a happy life? Or E, to save his people from this from their sin? Well, I'll give you a hint. E is the answer. Jesus came to save his people from their sin. It says that in Matthew 121. Even before he arrived, the angel came to Joseph and said, your, your, your Mary is going to have a baby and he's going to save his people from their sin. Like that was the reason he's, he's coming. That was the explanation. This is why this is happening. And so often, not only just in general society, but in, in churches as well, the whole purpose of life is to be happy. That's the issue. So when you look, about all, look at all the social stuff going on, you know, a while ago it was whether or not gay marriage is okay, now it's whether or not a woman could be a man or a man could be a woman, and, and then now you got the big, big uh, Roe versus Wade rehash again, and that war's starting now. And, and with all these things, they all point to the worldly idea that the whole purpose of life is to be happy. And if someone wants, if someone isn't happy being a man, then if they can be a woman and be happy, then let them. And if someone is, is thinking this unborn child getting in their way is going to make them unhappy. Well, they got to be happy, so you got to let them. And, and that seeps into the church as well. So you have a, a whole nation of people who are just trying to be happy or thinking that that is the end goal. It's happiness. And yet, Jesus came not to make us happy. He came to save his people from their sin. And that that is... That's the big dilemma, that's the big problem, and that is what our message needs to focus on. It's, it's the sin issue. And that's a problem for us, because there are four words we don't like to say. <laughs> four words as Christians that, that we, they just don't like coming across our lips, because we know what's gonna happen, or we think we know what's gonna happen when they get to the ears of that unbeliever. These words right here, I really think this, these are the words that cause us to be introverted and not share the gospel, or just play it safe and, and just think, you know, I, I really, I really need to find something else to do because I really don't want to get into this. And yet, if you don't cover these four words in some way, the person's not going to understand what it is they need to be saved from. They don't need to be saved from depression. That might be happening. That might be part of it. That's not the main reason they need to be saved. They need to be saved from, from, from sin. So this is a pendulum, and it swings both ways. And in church history, there's a saying, the pendulum swings both right, ways. And so what that's referring to is like, so a long time ago, within the history of this country, history of the, of the church, there was a time when people would go to church and the main message they would always hear is, you're going to hell, God is a God of wrath, and you know, you have the whole turn, turn or burn and the fire, fire and brimstone preacher. That was like the norm. That's what society saw the church as, is all these people who were just telling people they were going to hell. Which is true, but it's not the whole story. And so the church just kind of got this reputation that well, that's where all the mean people are, and that that's where all the, the you know the very serious people are. And 
they weren't fo- the church wasn't focusing on love, it wasn't focusing on forgiveness. Those were all part of it, but the main reputation that the church has kind of had was just the wrath of God. And so the pendulum swung the other way, and now we live in a time in church history, or I, th- I would say maybe we're coming out of time and going into who, who knows what. Now we live in a time when you don't, don't really hear a whole lot about the wrath of God on a Sunday morning if you're flipping channels on church services. You're not going to hear about hell. You hear about the love of God and forgiveness and the kindness of God. And, and the number one thing that every person knows, or, or at least they, they claim, when you ask them about God is, God is love. God loves me. God loves me and has a wonderful plan for my life. And so the main thing that people are focused on right now is the love of God. And and yet, both things are true. God is love, but that's not all he is. God is also a God of wrath and a God of of, uh, holiness. And, and, And so anytime you're focused on one attribute of God, you're going to be missing something else, right? But today, that's what that's what people know. And so the problem with that is that when people have this idea of God, there should have been two words, but it, the people have this idea of God that he's just love. Well, if God is just love, why is it that there would be anything about me that he wouldn't like? Because, because my grandma loves me, and she knows some of the bad stuff I do, do but she would never send me to hell, she, she, you know, if she loves me. And it doesn't make sense in the mind of someone this mixed message as they, as they see. And I can understand that, because if all they're hearing their whole life is God is love, then why is it that, that God would hate anything about them, or not like, or, or crazy thought send them to hell? Like that makes no sense at all in the mind of someone who's just been told their whole life, God loves me, and that's who God is. And so that's why it's so important for, for us to be able to cover, the, cover these other aspects of God, because, because I'll tell you what, people have a, a very warped understanding of God. A lot of times they'll cling to that. Even if you show them scripture, they'll just cling to that. Say, no, they, they, they just love it. And that might take time for them to, to get past, but, <coughs> oh, excuse me, sorry, I don't know if I shielded that enough. Um, People need to understand that there's more to God about than just uh, His love. So let's look at let's look at some common uh, gospel sayings here. So you might hear these in a in a message from a church, or you know, if you're like at a crusade or something, or even just in normal conversation. These are common phrases you hear when people are talking about the gospel. All you need to do is believe. If you pray this prayer with me, you'll you'll become a Christian, or if you repeat after me. Now, each one of these, in the context of the right um, message, right communication, they're they're fine. It would be fine. Because it is true, in in a sense, all you need to do is believe about certain things. If you pray a prayer, that's good. (laughs) And and if you repeat after me, if a person understands what it is they're talking about, you're talking about, then there's not necessarily a lot with that. But, so often, these phrases are, are not communicated in a way to where people get the full context of what's going on. And so, like, a great example of that would be a typical sinner's prayer, whether it be in some gospel tracts or at the end of a gospel message at a church. And so here's a, trip, a typical sinner's prayer. Okay, so, so the preacher would, would he preach a sermon and he'd say, okay, if you want to get saved, if you want to become a Christian, repeat after me. If you want to go to heaven when you die, pray this prayer and mean it with all your heart. Jesus, I need you in my life. I have a hole in my heart and I need you to fill it. Please come into my heart and give me the peace and joy I am missing. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I believe I am now a child of God. <coughs> Thank you, Lord. And so this is actually a typical prayer, and I've been in um, messages or or at the end of of sermons where after a group of people pray this prayer, they they look up, and the pastor says to them, congratulations, you're now a child of God. And then they might start talking about how 
we're assured of salvation, salvation, and you can never lose your salvation, and on and on. So in this person's mind, that guy just said, I'm a child of God, and I can't lose my salvation. And that person goes on with their life, and 10 years later, they might be just remembering that. They might be asking themselves, well, am I good with God? Well, the guy said I was a child of God, so I'm good. And they go on with their life. And there are so many people who live that way. And you'll probably meet some of them <laughs> today because it is, it is such a common thing. But anyway, that's a sinner's prayer. Now, the question comes up, is there anywhere in the Bible where it has a very short, quick summary of the gospel? If you were going to say the gospel and exactly what it is in, in two verses. Could you do that? And the answer is yes. It's found in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. But before we look at 3 and 4, let's look at 1 Corinthians 15, 1 and 2. This is Paul speaking. He says, Now I made known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preached to you, which also you receive, in which also you stand, by which you are also saved, if you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. So in verses one and quarter two, catch that, he's saying, I'm about to tell you the gospel. This is the one I taught you. This is the one you're saved by. This is the one you believed in. So he's saying, what I'm about to say, this is the gospel. And then he says it in verse three. For I delivered to you as of first importance that what I also received, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. Jesus Christ died on the cross, and he rose from the dead. That is the gospel. That's it. It's the gospel. Now, back to the sinner's prayer. What is wrong with this prayer? What is wrong with this gospel prayer? Anyone? No mention of sin. No mention of sin? Promises you have joy and peace. Yes. But thinking back to, to what we just looked at, definition of the gospel, there's no gospel in this gospel <laughs> presentation. Like there's no gospel. It's not in there. It's just not there. You know? In, in 1 Corinthians 15, 17, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. 1 Corinthians 15, 14, if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain. In other words, if the death and resurrection of, of Christ didn't happen, or if it's not part of this whole equation, the whole thing is, is just worthless. The death and resurrection of Jesus Christ is the gospel. Now, you know, you're saying, we know that. Um, but I'll tell you what, so often we will do gospel presentations and we won't even mention the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it's, it's easy to do. Maybe um, you'll be giving your testimony and you'll get into all the, the sorrows and how horrible your life was and then how God changed you and, and how great it is now. And you never mention the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it's funny because I, I teach uh, kind of the preparation to get baptized class at our church. In a lot of ways, it's kind of like a new believers class. And so if someone comes to our church and they want to get baptized, we say, okay, you just, you, we have this 30-minute uh, class, and we're just going to go over what it means to be a Christian. And as part of it, um, I have them write out their testimony, because you could learn a lot from a person's testimony, one thing, whether they're saved or not, um, sometimes. But... So they give me their testimony, and I said, okay, this, this is the testimony, and make sure you, you include the gospel in it. This is what you're going to be saying when you get baptized um, in, in front of everybody. Um, and I would say 95% of the time, they do not mention the gospel. It's all a story about themselves, which makes sense, because like they're talking about what happened to them and what God did to them. So it's not that like they're doing anything wrong, but a lot of times, we just don't think about that. We, we, we get into this debate about morality and, and why homosexuality is, is, you know, sin and all these things. And we win the debate, we walk away, and we never even present it to the unbeliever what it is they need to do in order to, to get saved. And, and, and so that's, it's just a very important thing to remember <laughs> that this is a gospel outreach we need to be presenting 
the gospel. So, in a community like this, where, where there are a lot of church people, or people who went to church and, and, and don't go there anymore, or, you know, there are a lot of people that you'll run into, and you'll be presenting the gospel to them, or you might even ask them, what is the gospel? And they'll say, well, Jesus Christ died on the cross, right? Rose on the dead. So, so many people, I don't even think most people, have the understanding of that knowledge. They have the information. But then the question is, what is it you're trusting in? What are you trusting in? So I was raised Catholic, and as a Catholic, my view of Jesus was that he was God, he is God, and that he died on the cross and rose from the dead. But if you were to ask me, are you going to heaven? I'd say, yeah. And, and if you were asking me why, I would start listing all the good things that I've done and that I'm doing, and the reason God is going to accept me, and it was all based on me. And whether it's Catholicism or Jehovah's Witness or Mormon, Mormonism or so many different religions, and even non-religions, they may, oh, I never thought about it, but if God was to judge me because I'm trusting in me. They don't say it that way, but that, that's what it comes down to. And a lot of times they talk about treating others with respect, doing charity, and, and all the bad things they, they don't do. And that's just kind of the, the view. That's, that's the thought of why a person's going to get into heaven. And because of that, it's so important that when you're talking to religious people, that you, you understand, this, you have these verses ready that talk about works righteous not, what works righteousness not being the thing to get you into heaven. So Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not as a result of works that no one may boast. And that's such a clear verse, Romans 4, 5. But to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. That's a great verse right there, showing it's not about works. You got the guy who doesn't work, and he believes, and he's the one who, who God credits as righteousness. And then Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gracious gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Even though people do good, good works, the issue, again, comes back to sin. All of us have sinned, all fall short for the glory of God, and that's why we need a Savior. It's so important to, re to remember the cross. And I'll tell you, you know, Chris mentioned being ashamed of the gospel, and a lot of times that really is the issue. It's a lot easier to, to talk about all the ins and outs of some social thing or maybe some scientific thing or something where you feel smart, you, you feel intelligent, and it's almost like I feel on the same level as this person in, in a way. It's, it's just um, that feeling of equality in some way. But when you t bring up the cross and, and the aud audacious idea that someone actually died on the cross and then they rose from the dead again, that's crazy in the eyes of unbelievers. And so that's why that is, is where the, the shame comes in, the feeling of shame. Because now you now you just jump ship <laughs> as far as they're concerned on, on as, they're, as far as they're concerned on the view of reality, and now this person is involved in, in in crazy talk. Well, it's not crazy. We worship a God who can do anything. That's one of the things he he's done, and that's what our, our faith is in. And so we need to remember that it's, it's all about the cross. Colossians two thirteen. When you were dead in your transgressions and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him having forgiven us all our transgressions, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. And, and for all the things we're going to learn here this, this, this uh, weekend, I would just say keep your eyes on the cross, because that is what the person in front of you needs the most when you're talking to the unbeliever. I just want to close with this Quote by John Piper, he said, The gospel is the news that Jesus Christ, the righteous one, died for our sins and rose again, eventually eternally triumphant over all his enemies, so that there is now no condemnation for those who believe, but only everlasting joy. That's the gospel. That's a, that's a great little summary of the gospel and, and 
what what it's all about. So as we're out here this weekend, I just I want I want to just realize two things. One, we do this for the people we talk to. We do this so people can hear the gospel message and possibly gain everlasting life. But number two, we do it for ourselves as well. And I'll tell you what, the, the more times you enter into a gospel conversation, the more times you strive with someone, the more times you, you have a, a, a good encounter, the more you just, just realize, man, this, this, is what I, this is what I was made to be doing. This is what I should be doing. And so if this isn't something you're very comfortable with, I would just say take the opportunity for the next couple of days, or even if this is the only day you're going to be here, and just apply yourself, step out in faith. You know, maybe you've never handed out a gospel track before. Well, maybe that's your goal today, is you're going to hand out five gospel tracks to someone, right? Maybe that's your goal. Maybe you've handed out gospel tracks before, but you never actually have talked to anyone and spoken to anyone. Let that be your goal today. You're going to use that gospel track as a way to get into a conversation, and, and your team leaders will, will show you how to do that. But whatever it is, I, I, I would say, man, for the glory of God, just step out of your comfort zone and, and just be willing to let God use you to get to that, that next level of comfort, whatever, whatever that might be, today as, as we uh, just take the opportunity with all the people here who are looking at these beautiful flowers and don't even know who made the flowers. And so, so that's our goal, is just to share the gospel with the people around us today. Let's pray. Lord God, I just thank you so much for this opportunity to be used by you to spread your gospel, to share the good news. Lord God, when we were in sin, with no hope, you did something about it. You died on the cross and rose from the dead and paid the price for our sin. And I just thank you so much that you've given us your righteousness, Lord. We don't, we're, we're nothing, we deserve nothing, and yet you've seen fit to just, just make us your children in that way. And I ask that you would help us to follow you and obey you today in, in this task of telling other people's, people about you, Lord. We love you, we just thank you, and you know. So, so, Excited, Father, just to be used by you. We just ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, and one last thing, I'm going to take advantage of my place at the pulpit to shamelessly plug my book. So this is a book on evangelism. It can be used um, in your personal study. It can also be used in a group setting at church, and it just goes through a lot of the basic, um, basic things about it evangelism, both the theology behind it, and then the practical steps on how, how you share your faith. So it's out there at the uh, book table. So thank you guys so much.